Partnership of the Historical Bostons is a partnership of people in Boston, England and Boston, Massachusetts, who were both interested in the contributions of the 17th century to our thought patterns, to our activity patterns, to what we believe in today. Uh, that's why it's called a partnership. Um, we do a series of walking tours, we do a series of lectures. In the fall, we do lectures. In the spring, we do reading groups. And all throughout the summer, we do walking tours as well as, uh, as lectures. Um, and so since COVID came in, we've been learning how to digitize these lectures and give them as speaking tours. Uh, and Waltham Historical Society asked me to give a lecture. Um, I've given the same substantially the same lecture to uh, Bedford and to Winthrop Historical Society, um, all of whom have special connections to Boston. And you'll see a little bit of those stories in here. But anyway, so um, I happen to be the president. This is my third year as the presidency. Uh, the organization is now 21 years old. Um, we're all volunteers. It's not very big, but we try to do what we can to promote the story of and learn from the story of Boston in its early years. So let's see if this all works. Um, maybe it's not, there we go, okay. So Boston in 1630 was a peninsula. You'll see another slide of it, but this is all it was. There's this, uh, if you can see my mouse, I can't see my mouse, there we go. This is a very neck, very narrow neck that connected Boston to uh, the mainland. Um, and at high tide, the water actually flowed over the neck and Boston was for a little, a little time on several certain times a year was an island. When we do a walking tour, it's a six or seven stop walking tour. And we start here at the state house and talk about who the Puritans were and why they came here. Then we go down to Blackstone uh, and Founders Memorial in Blackstone's house and talk about the first six months of the of 1630 and how things began to be organized as winter was coming on. Then we move up to the middle of the common where archaeologists have found a large remnant of a large common fireplace. And it seemed like the, the colonists gathered around the fireplace in the winter of 1630 to try and stay warm and to dig in and to build whatever wigwams and underground shelters they could to stay warm. Then we work, move on to Granary Graveyard, which is the second oldest graveyard in Boston. And it was, as you can see, part of, this is, this is the original shape of Boston Common, uh, was part of the common. Um, and we talk about population growth and population demise and young children who died very early and how they were buried and stuff like that. Uh, and then we go on to uh, bury, first burying ground, which is the oldest. And that really begins the dialogue between John Winthrop um, and others who supported him and others who opposed him and how they worked together to work out what actually Boston was and would become. And then finally, we move along here to what was the original shoreline to talk about the development of commerce between 1630, 1632, 1634, and how that became the important and survival part of Boston. So this is, this is what the tour works like. And all of our tours go like this. They go in some sort of circular pattern in Boston, places that have a special significance to Boston and that place becomes the focus of the lecture for that location. So now what did Boston look like? <clears throat> Most of the early maps of Boston, like what we just saw, are, are horizontal. So you don't really have a sense of what the geographic organization of Boston was. Boston is almost exactly a north-south town. Um, and so this is the original shape of Boston. This is where the neck, this is where it connects to Roxbury. This is where the common is today. This is Noddles Island, and up here is uh, the other islands around Boston. But it was a fairly small place. It was about three square miles, four square miles. Um, became fairly heavily populated by 1635 when people were moving out because they wanted to find larger spaces. But as we'll see, their first groups 
came to Charlestown because they had to contest a land grant that included Boston and, and, and included the North Shore. And if they hadn't contested it, we might not have ever found our own place in, in history. So here we were, this is our first stop. Um, I'm seeing thumbnails here. Can everybody see the whole screen or is most of it occluded? I guess you can see it okay. This is where we would start. Um, we would be standing up here talking about uh, this area, which is the sort of the top of the hill. There's a, um, the profile of Boston comes up to here and then the Beacon Hill behind us is really quite large. There's a, uh, after 1634, when there was some uh, danger of invasion, uh, there was a large torch built on top of it, the, a large uh, beacon so that people could see it, light the beacon, and it would be a call to people to, to come to Boston for its defense. So that's why this is called Beacon Hill, because there was a beacon on here that could be lit in time of danger to signal that people should, should gather to uh, repel the invaders. By way of history, um, 1620 is when the Pure, when the pilgrims arrived in Plymouth. But what was happening already is they were learning how to have an econ economy that would, that would support them. They were always small, but, uh, but Reverend John White was one of the founders and wanted to see the economic part of uh, New England spread out. Uh, and he became really important to us up here. Meanwhile, in 1625, King Charles I assigns the throne with a Catholic wife. And this is where the real diatribe about whether we have an Episcopal or a Catholic religion and what that means. And the stranglehold that begins to tighten around the necks of persons who believe that what we should be doing is purifying the religion to strike away all of the things that aren't mentioned in the Bible that are problematic to begin with um, and to become a more pure form of religion. By 1628, Reverend White has separated from the pilgrims and has believed that there ought to be a New England company which should have a land grant for the northern part of New England, above the Charles River originally, I think, and begins to formulate a an idea and sends the first settlers over uh, and they land and settle around uh, just south of Boston. And he, had, he has the first land grant to Boston, but that doesn't exist anymore. There are no copies of it <clears throat> and we have no idea what it says, but to me the likelihood is that it was for a much smaller area of land than the royal patent, which was given to the Massachusetts Bay Company in 1629 by the king, which since it's signed by the king, overruled all of the commercial patterns that had been given by the New England Company and others. And by, land, by law, then the persons who were to settle here, the governor and the company, had a legal right to lands that overwhelmed the boundaries and the grants previously given by the New England Company. That, those boundaries that we had were three miles to the north of the furthermost part, northern part of the Merrimack River to three miles south of the southernmost part of the Charles River. And there was a great deal of planning that went on to how to effectuate this settlement. The Winthrop fleet of 11 ships, which was the third wave coming over, the first wave in 1628, the second wave of three ships in 1629, and then the third large wave of 11 ships and 700 or more persons left from England to come here to settle in the uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony. What were they leaving? They were leaving a medieval form of England that was dying, but was still remembered fondly. In that medieval landscape, there wasn't ownership by persons. There was ownership by, uh, by persons who were landlords and they could own a town. 
And within that town, each person would have, there would be generally three large fields and one field a year would be live fallow and the cows were sent on there to manure, manure the per, land and, re, and renew it. And then there would be two years of uh, farming on that land and then the third year again, it would be fallow. And within each of these fields, there would be fields uh, of about 10 acres, each divided into one acre strips. And a family would have a strip here and a strip in this field and a strip in this field and a strip in this field. And, and 10 or 20 of these strips, 20 acres would be enough to feed a family for a year. But they all worked in common. And they would have, each family would be responsible for having a, a plow or an oxen or something like that. And they would all work together. And there would be, generally speaking, two teams of oxen, because uh, they would have to be eight oxen to plow this. And, and one, one team would plow this field and one team would just plow this field. And then they would go back to the barns and uh, be, be fed. Okay, so that worked for 600 years almost. But then England became, became a, a, an economic entity and said, okay, we can convert these fields to sheep fields and sell the wool. And since the land was not owned by the peasants who farmed it, but by the owners, they could be thrown off the land with no consequences. And consequently, there was a great rift of people thrown into the economy who had no other forms of uh, economic income and this graph shows the value of a person's labor for a day in terms of the amount of food that they could buy or produce, but buy to feed a family of four. And you can see that in, by, the, by the first part of uh, the period in which people were thrown off the land, a person would have labor enough by a day to feed by five or six days worth of food. But by time the, the, their labor had become so abundant because so many were thrown off the field, in a day the person could just barely make enough uh, income to feed a family of four for a day's worth of labor. So this says something about how uh, undervalued and labor became and how many people there were who became excess. This is an actual painting of the sheep mark in, in Boston, England uh, in 1820, I think. And you can see that by this time, all of these people have been depopulated from the land. It's been turned over a sheep economy. And this number, of, there are these numbers of sheep who are ready to be purchased and their wool uh, shorn to make wool and to cotton. And in fact, the, uh, the royal uh, crest of the town of Boston is this, showing how close they are to the ocean. We'll see, we won't really see that, but, they, but Boston is a, is a sea town as Boston, England is a sea town in the same way Boston Mass is. But look at this, there's a sheep lying on a wool sack. And that was the real economy of Boston in the 1800s and after the 1700s and after 1650. The other thing that was cur concur currently happening was uh, the Catholicism that was resurgent. And persons who believe that the church should be purified of Catholic Catholic superstition were being purged and and in some cases killed. And the the thing that we should know it was that there was a book called the Acts and Monuments, otherwise generally known as Fox's Book of Martyrs, that went through ten separate editions between 1654 and 1651, and between 1554 and 1651. In that nine years, there were ten separate editions of this book published, mostly having woodcuts like this showing people being strangled and people being burned. And the import of that was. Catholicism is rampant and is ruining our religion. And this and the vast amount of economic suffering were two things that were propelling people to look for how can I move out of England to find some other place where this won't be happening. So people came, to get, came together. Uh, Pilgrim had, I mean, the Plymouth Plantation had survived just barely 
but people could see that it was a going concern by 1625 after five years of intense labor. And it was enough with John White and the Puritan fathers who wanted to see us move along and engage to say, okay, we should, in, we should develop a plan for a large scale colonization of uh, the new world of New England. And from the records, we can see this is the uh, constitution of people who actually by 1635 had made, cast their lot and had decided to come to Boston and New England. These are the first known occupations of 344 persons whose occupation is recorded. And you can see where they come from. This is Boston. Boston, England is right here. <clears throat> the smallest percentage of people come here, but the largest percent of leaders come here. Then these counties on the east of England and London, which is here, contributed more than the largest number. And the west counties, uh, <clears throat> with the counties that contributed the fishing uh, people who were able to ultimately develop the economy by building ships and by fishing. And these, the economics that these people provided ultimately were the things that were the driving force in, in Massachusetts as an economic entity. They were very serious about how they had to plan this to make it work. From 1628, the first group who came over in a single ship, this is what they had decided they had to bring for 100 people in that ship. They had to bring 400 pairs of skewers and 300 pairs of stockings and 400 shirts and all of this stuff. All of this is in the early records of Massachusetts and it was nothing that was ill-planned. There was serious planning that went into what do we have to bring with us to make this a viable economy. We had to bring arms for 100 people. That would be three drums, three ensigns, because we we're going to be uh, obviously a military uh, formation and halberds and 80 mus muskets for 100 people and six long filing pieces so people go out and, and game gear, uh, gear and uh, uh, muskets and all of this stuff was, was things that were thought of and put together and per came in the first ship with Governor Endicott in 1628. In other words, look at it, all these other these other these long lists of things that had to be gathered, and each family had to be responsible for bringing this amount of uh, and material with them. For one person, would for a year would take eight eight bushels of meal and two bushels of peas and two bushels of oatmeal and a gallon of oil. So multiply this by four, six, eight, or ten for a family. And you can see that persons were expected to be able to be self-sufficient for basically a year and a half after they got here until the first crop could come in and presuming that they would come in winter too late to plant. And so they would go through, have to go through 18 months of food and have supplies for 18 months of food to before their first uh, crop came in. The problem with, that they were facing was one of does the royal grant given us by the king overwhelm all of the other grants that have been given by the Massachusetts Foundation and the company? In particular, they had to deal with a gentleman by the name of John Oldham. He had been active in Plymouth, had been thrown out of Plymouth, had come back to Plymouth, ingratiated himself with Plymouth, and they realized that he as a trader was important to Plymouth's economic survival they actually gave him a bunch of seditious letters that had been collected to bring back to England to show the investors in England how bad things were from the point of view of people who were disenfranchised. And he did, and he brought them back and they were opened. And he realized at that point that he had an opportunity. And in 1628, he bought a land grant from the Massachusetts company, Boston company, that was in fact all of the land from north of the Charles River to south of the Saugus River, all of this area was his land grant. And so when people were coming over in 1628, 1629 and saying that we have, since we have a royal patent, the, the crown has si signed our patent, we overwhelm any of these economic ventures that are only by commission. 
but we have to enforce ourselves. And so in the second wave, the sick wave that came over in 1629, there was an absolute decision that 50 people should not plant in Salem and around there, but should come down to Charlestown to plant in here so that they could be a visual way of contesting the grant of, of uh, John Oldham. And he didn't, he was perfectly willing to put up with them actually, because he realized that his economic interests were, were went beyond this piece of the land and he became important. But in order to uh, effectuate the patent, it had to be brought here. It could not be left in England because if it could be left in England, it was a legal document and it could be uh, summoned uh, and, uh, and then contested and possibly burned up. So after a series of disputes about how independent are we really and do we have the right to bring our patent with us, the vote was taken on the 29th of August of 1629 that yes, in fact, by a, a erect, erection of hands, we would in fact bring the patent physically to us so that it cannot be confiscated. And we did that. It looks like this. It is a very long document, obviously written by an attorney. It's been my contention forever that John Winthrop actually was the writer of this as an attorney. Um, it's not a simple land grant. It's, it's probably in terms of words, six or seven or eight times more words than the other contemporary land grants that were being given. It's very repetitive. It says we should do this and everybody shall do this and everybody shall do this because of all of the things. And it's a real legal document. But basically what it says is we own this land. You can't take it away from us. And what was this land that we were granted? We were granted a charter for three miles north of the mouth of the Merrimack River to three miles south of the Charles River. The current border of Massachusetts is here and follows this parallel line out here. But that ain't what the grant said and that ain't what we intended. And so this is, the, uh, this is Lake Winnipesaukee and the Merrimack River enters, exits out of Winnipesaukee. And this is the Charles River and it exits here. This is the Plymouth Plantation. Plymouth had a land grant that looked like this and their Western border was so, sort of indeterminate. And in fact, our Western border was indeterminate too because the land grant goes from sea to sea, putting that question aside. This area was the original area that was, that was populated, obviously. But in point of fact, by uh, 1650, we had sent surveyors north along the Merrimack to find out where the actual source of the Merrimack was and claim this area, which includes all the way to Portland, Maine, and claim this area, which includes uh, all the way down to uh, Rhode Island, basically. This is, this is the current Rhode Island border. And recognize that this area was Plymouth Plantation, but the, since the, the termination here was vague, there was a lot of back and forth about exactly where uh, the Massachusetts border was here, was it here or was it here, meant how much of this land could we have because it's very fa fallow. But at any rate, this is what we this is what we got in the charter. And in our defense of the charter in 1646, when it was contested. These were some of the instructions that were given to uh, the uh, people who went as emissaries to England to defend the charter. We claim that we have not been given this land by a commission, which is to say, if we do good, it's ours, but by a free donation of absolute government. The charter says that our liberty is expressed that free men only, that, that the voters are free men, not persons who have a certain income every year. And that since we have an absolute power of government, we came here not for economic reasons, but we came here to abide here and to plant the gospel and to people the country. And herein God have marvel hath marvelously blessed us. We are doing what the charter says we are doing. You have no right to take it back. But it basically said, we have this as a free donation of absolute government. The Arbella fleet so-called because the Arbella was uh, the charter ship of the uh, fleet, uh, left 
in, in between June and uh, early July of 1630, carrying, depending on how you count these vessels, between 700 and 1,000 people. It was a storm crossed, crossed, storm toss crossing because of the fact that the current flows from America to England, the transportation from England to America takes a very long time. It's contrary to the winds and stuff like that. And so the fleet arrived, generally speaking, 12 to 14 weeks after it left England. The return trip, since you're with the current and with the wind, only takes three weeks. So that can say how much easier it was for us to go to England than it was to return. But nonetheless, every all of the ships made it safely. But what they found was not what they'd hoped they found. They had been led to believe that the, that the people were happy and economically surviving and that we could join them and that they would be able to absorb most of our people. What they found were a few rude, rude huts and people who were hungry. Salem Pioneer Village is worthwhile going to see. Um, it was actually made in, in 1930, so it's coming up on its 100th anniversary. Um, it's a little bit dilapidated, but I think they're going to re-thatch these buildings. But it's intended to be what Salem looked like in, six, in 1630 as the, Pilgr as the Puritans were arriving. This is a wigwam. It's a structure of bent twigs covered by bark. Uh, this is a house, this is the governor's house, I think, the thatch is there. The chimney is not a brick chimney, it's actually a wooden chimney that's plastered inside with uh, plaster and stuff like that, and, and if the plaster falls out, it becomes highly flammable. John Wesley, the governor, was an optimist, and he reported that they were supplied with good venison pastry and good beer, and most of the people went on shore and gathered fine strawberries. That was what he reported back of the landing of the Arbella. His deputy governor, Dudley, who becomes very important in this, we found them in a sad and unexpected condition. Eight of the 300 people were dead, and many of those alive were weak and sick, and all of the corn and bread amongst them were hardly sufficient to feed them for a night food fortnight. So they hadn't really become economically sufficient, yes, at this point, and they were learning. But it meant that they could not, the people coming from the fleet could not expect to stay right in Salem because there was no possibility they could be fed. And so they made a decision that they would have to join the group from the previous one that had gone to uh, Charlestown to contest the uh, the grant of John Oldham and spread out from there. And they actually founded three towns in the first year, which is what we talked to talk about in step two, Founders Memorial. This is down the hill from Boston. At this point on the building, there is this plaque, which we'll see in the next slide. And then we'll see this, which is the 1630 Memorial of Winthrop greeting uh, Blackstone and, and introducing himself uh, to Boston, so to speak. William Blackstone had been here. Um, he was one of the original uh, people. He came with Oldham and others, um, had been a settled, a settled here uh, and probably had been on this site for four or five years by 1630. He didn't like the people. He was high church. Um, he didn't like their uh, Puritan religion. Um, and so his land grant was purchased. Well, I don't know who it is. Um, his land grant of 50, uh, they decided his land grant was 50, 58 acres and purchased it from him in 1635 and he left and went to Rhode Island. Um, so he owned most of the Boston Peninsula uh, and was recognized as the owner of Boston Peninsula until he was bought out, bought out in 1635. This is a statue. This is Blackstone, this is Winthrop, this is probably Minister, uh, this is uh, uh, Pollard, what's her first name, I've forgotten, who was eight when she came and lived to be 108 and was a person who recounted a lot of what is sort of the early, early lore, lore of Boston. She lived in Boston all of her life, 100 years. Um, they're pulling the boats ashore from the Arbella, which is here, 
There are Native Americans watching them come ashore. And on this side, there is a woman who represents the fecundity and a man who represents the martial interest that kept the, county, the colony together for the years. Winthrop wrote a lecture or a sermon or somebody really knows what, it, what, it's, what it's all about. But in that sermon, we find what his intentions were, that the rich and mighty should not eat not up the poor, should not eat up the poor, that is to say that they had to be recognized, the economic interests of persons, um, and had not to disrupt them. And at the same time, the, the, the poor and despised may not rise up against the superiors and throw off their yoke. They would form a, the super, superiors of this would form a, by, would make a due form of government, both civil and ecclesiastical, which would have the care of the public and must oversway all private respects. And that's the work that we aim at. And if we do not do that, and he firmly believed that, he firmly believed was that the Lord God was active, an active uh, actor in this and the Lord God will surely break out in wrath against us, be revenged of such a perjured people and make us known the breach of our, of such, of our covenant. So Winthrop is in his own way, a very, very religious person um, and absolutely believes that this is, that they are on God's mission. Uh, and if they don't do what they intend to do, uh, they will be a great uh, disaster. So they've, they've decided that they've got to have three new uh, towns in 1630. And so in the uh, meeting of, in Charlestown, Charlton called Charlestown, called Charlton in those days, um, they named Trimontane, she'll be called Boston, called Tremontan be, because, because of the geography of the three hills in Boston, shall be called Boston. Mattapan shall be called Dorchester and the, Charles, and the town upon the Charles River shall be called Watertown. These are the three original towns plus Salem and Boston. And he also, they also in the same meeting decided that it was best that they not really examine what the charter says because the charter says that all free men are involved in the election, but that they would hold the charter away from the people and the uh, assistance of whom there could be up to 13 would be the sole source of government. And they, from the, the assistants would elect the governor and the, and the deputy governor from amongst themselves. And they should have the power of making all the laws. Um, and, uh, and, and, that, and that was decided by a vote of the people. But so the very first form of government was very hierarchical, where 13 people who are the electors who are the assistants, have the to total uh, control of government. They had to get through the first winter. Um, as I said, there is on the common an area that has been excavated to show that there was a large communal fireplace somewhere around here. And the kind of, the kind of uh, things that they lived in were wigwam huts, uh, and basically bent sticks that were covered by barch, by bark and some kind of a thing, or they might have done more like uh, uh, wigwams uh, from Native Americans, but they had to get through the first winter and uh, they had to realize that there was a sharpness of the, pure, the climate creeping in or caused death and sickness. And there was a substantial, there was a loss of about 30% over the first winter. So by the end of the first year, Christmas is not celebrated, it's not mentioned in the Bible, there are 36 families living on Boston. They have a house lot spread all over the town. All of this area, this is where Blackstone's house is. That's his house, that's his uh, orchard. Uh, and he owns all of this area. Still he has 50 acres, which are basically Boston Common. Uh, and they are huddling around a large common fire to the extent they can in the center of what's not a common. They were starving. And they also had scurvy. And the thing that saved them was William Pierce, who was master of the ship, uh, the, 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 the ship, what's it called? Uh, but anyway, he had visited Boston on a, uh, 
after having sold a load to the pilgrims in, in Plymouth, just as the Puritan fleet was pulling in in July and June. And so Governor Winthrop, on his own authority, commissioned Captain Pierce to go back to Boston, to England, to resupply, as buy as much supplies as he possibly could, and to retune as fast as he possibly could. And Pierce really saved the colony at this point because he came back. He made a winter, winter return, got back on the 5th of March in 1631 with much food and a goodly supply of lemons, the juice of lemons to combat scurvy and many recovered speedily. The 5th of March had been ordained, ordained as a day of fasting. The last of the food was almost gone. Winthrop is reported to have given the last cup of, of meal to a starving person just as, the, uh, as, the, as Pierce was sighted coming into the harbor. And the 22nd of March was given as a day of Thanksgiving and the food was distributed and starvation was avoided. I've given this talk three times and part of it has to do with Pierce and uh, his connection uh, with the part of land that he had uh, and the Winthrop Historical Society's house, which is there. At any rate, they had good relations with the Native Americans. And since they didn't have any draft animals and they didn't have any plows with them in the first wave, they had to figure out and they had to learn from the Native Americans how actually to plant the land. And the land is planted in mounds. And in the springtime, as the alewives come up the river, they are captured in their thousands and their hundred thousands and they're used to fertilize these mounds. And the first planting is Indian corn. And then after the three kernels, after the three uh, seeds are planted or four seeds are planted and they come up in the mound, after they're up about three inches, then you can plant the beans and the beans will wind around them. Their tendrils will wind around the corn stalks and grow upwards as the corn stalks grow upwards. And when they're high enough for up and the last of their leaves have appeared above the ground, then you plant the pumpkins and the squash and they have very broad leaves and they will shade out the land so that weeds can't get a, get a footing. And so this, this, this is a way of called three sisters learned from the Native Americans, three sisters being the corn and the beans and the squash. And it is one of the most productive ways to grow in any way possible. And it doesn't require a plow to do it and doesn't require draft animals to do it. And this is what they learned on how to do it. Pierce, meanwhile, as soon as he uh, left his uh, load, his first load in, in, in February, sailed back to England for another load. In this case, he brought back people. And he arrived on November 2nd, 1631, just as har the harvest was being brought in. And to the great joy, he brought people as well as supplies, and including the people were Winthrop's wife and his uh, children. The people came to welcome them with great stores of provisions, fat hogs, kids' venison, poultry, grease, partridges, and the joy and manifestation of love had never been seen before in, in New England. We kept a day of Thanksgiving on Boston, on November 11, 1631. This is not what we consider to be uh, Thanksgiving Day. Thanksgiving Day is a commemoration of the first Thanksgiving in Plymouth Colony. But this is the first one that was really called a great Thanksgiving. And it recognized, it, it was the first point at which the colony can say, yes, we are successful, we can feed ourselves. So now we would move to Granary Graveyard because we have to talk about the growth of population. This is difficult because this area in the graveyard in this tombstone is the tombstone of children who are not baptized. And so we're not religious saved. It's hard to know. But at any rate, it's sad. This is probably the saddest place in the whole colony. Um, there are many, as many as 5,000 babies buried in this common tomb. 
Fortunately, the early records of Boston allow us to actually make some mathematical calculations of what the death rate was in the first year after birth. And also to look at how the population was separated between persons who were members of the church, those are persons who were free men who had been admitted to the church, and persons who were townspeople who were not members of the church. And this graph, in this graph, the church members are the dark line and the, the townspeople who are not church members, the wives of the townspeople, the birth rate, the number of births in that year uh, are the purple graph. Um, and you can see they're running in parallel. So that means roughly half of the people in town were not church members and half were. The records also for the townspeople, but not for the church members, indicate whether the, the whether that birth, that, that young child died within the first year. And so we have a record of the number of deaths that there were. And this graph is the record of number of deaths that there were each year between 1636 and 1645. And you can see it's basically horizontal while the number of births is increasing. So this line represents the average number of babies who died in the first year as a percentage, and it falls between 20 to 10% in 10 years. So at least during that period, and you can see the number of births falls off here because there's some strange part of recording, but at least for that, for that period between 1645, the colony was obviously prospering. The number of early deaths was, was decreasing, the number of population was continuously growing, and it was a period in which there was great growth in the population. This line, this line flattens out and this line goes to almost nothing in these years after 1646. This is the year in which there was revolution in England and Charles I was deposed and ultimately wind up having uh, being decapitated. Um, and during this period, many, many people went back from New England to Old England to join in the contest. And so there's very little population growth in these 10 years from the time that Charles is deposed to the child the time that the regicide is over and, and things start again. So it's sort of interesting. This is a graveyard where all four children had died in their first year. And each of these is an epitaph to the kids and that family. So it was a sad period in time, but the population was growing and the number Dad was an obstetrician. I had to had to figure that data out. Anyway, um, we all move next. Move to the earliest graveyard uh, where Winthrop's tomb exists, um, and we find this is where we begin to look at the strife between Winthrop and Dudley, and how their two views of the colonies merged and became a single view. But in 1632, they were deathly opposed over the issue of where the center should be, be. Dudley wanted there to be a fortified village in, in Cambridge. And he had, he had the whole of what we call, what we think of as downtown Cambridge today was in fact a fort. Um, and it was his idea that this is where government should have its center because it's a fortified village and if we get attacked, at least government won't be scattered. Winter's position was that's ridiculous. Um, we're going to be, if we're going to be attacked, we could be attacked from the land, from the sea, from all over the place. There is no place that we can effectively hide. And so Boston being the logical place because of its access to the sea should be the, should be the center of this colony. It's the economic life of the colony is in Boston. And so therefore I will accede to your demands that I build my house in Cambridge. So I will move my house from its original place in Charlestown where the, it had been, been the house of the person who's with the largest of the first family who's moved there content to contest the uh, John Oldham's land grant, had the house physically taken apart and moved to Cambridge and had it assembled and said, look, I have achieved what I said I would do. I moved my house to Cambridge. Then he took it apart again and moved it to Boston and said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, I did what I said I'd do. What are you gonna do about it? And they fell into a great fury and were very hot and they fell into bitterness, but they had to come to grips with each other. So they did it in 1633 through marriage. 
Dudley's son Samuel marries John Winthrop's daughter Mary, and they move uh, together. Um, and from then, Winthrop and Dudley recognize that they have to cooperate, and they go off and find a piece of land that they can actually share. Um, and Winthrop gets Dudley gets a thousand acres to the north of the of a border on the uh, on, on the Sudbury River, and Winthrop gets a thousand acres to the south of that same border, and they have a sharing of land, and they begin to work together, and they begin to live together. Dudley still continues to be important, though, and his contention is that we need to have more uh, autonomy and more independence. And in 1634, as I remember in 1631, uh, the charter had not been read and the decision was that the assistants, the 13 assistants would make all of the laws and the governor would be selected and the deputy governor would be selected from them. In 1634, Dudley refused to pay taxes, refused to have Watertown where he was the uh, town leader, refused the Watertown's uh, accession of taxes until it until the charter could be read and lo and behold when it read it said okay the governor the governor and the assistants are chosen at large from all of the population at a, at a general court um, by all freemen and he forced that to be instituted and from then on the first uh, the spring uh, gathering of the general court was the gathering which the, the governor was elected by all of the people who could be there. Since there were so many, they had to institute a, a representative government and each town could elect three representatives to go to the great general court to elect the governor uh, at the suggestion of whatever the town who they would want to see. Now, John Olden, who we've mentioned, was, a, was actually became a free man in 1631 became a representative from Watertown in 1632 and, uh, and was a general supporter at 1634 of the issue of general election. I think this is the last great general court that he attended because, uh, as we'll see, his life wasn't going to last too much longer. But meanwhile, he'd become an important citizen and the land was being divvied up. And his first land grant was in Watertown of 60 acres in the bend of the Charles River and another small piece by Millbrook. And I think this mill bridge is still the mill bridge that is by the factories as you're leaving Watertown. So he was a Watertown representative uh, and Watertown at that point was Watertown, the towns were much larger in their first uh, version. So Watertown was Watertown, Belmont, Waltham and Weston. Uh, and Waltham was the middle precinct of Watertown, and Weston was the western precinct, western precinct of Watertown, hence the name. So this is where he had his he had his first house, and the records report in 16th uh, in September 14th, his house burned down because they made a fire in it when he had no chimney. My sense is he was not very much at home because he was out trading. But as he became more and more of an important citizen. They wanted to give him a larger and larger land grant. And he got a, a land grant of 500 acres, which in, is in Watertown, is in Waltham. 500 acres of land is granted to Mr. John Oldham lying near Mount Feek on the northwest of the Charles River. Mount Feek was named by Governor Winthrop in January of 1631 for his son-in-law his daughter's husband, um, on an expedition where he went up the Charles River to explore what the Charles River landscape was, was and named Mount Feek. So this is Mount Feek Cemetery. This is the cemetery itself. This is where, this is where Mount Feek is in this patch of hilly area. It doesn't have graves in it. This is as near as I can do to what his uh, grant actually looked like. And this is what we see, if this will start. Oh, okay, there we go. Sanderson, we know Sanderson. That's his grave in Mount Feek Cemetery. And the other Sandersons, this is a Sanderson family plot. There's Nathan. 
Come on, move along. Uh, Ella Sanderson. There are five Sandersons as near as I can tell. And there's Edmund, Edmund Sanderson, whom uh, the lecture series is named for, who passed away in 1961. But anyway, Mount Feek is behind this, is this hillock here, and here we're climbing it. At the top, there is this large rock, which Renthrop said, standing on top of it, you could see out to the Nipponek, which is what he called the area to the west of Massachusetts, where the uh, Na Native Americans, uh, the Nipmunk, actually lived. He called that the Nipponek. So this is this is actually the the, the hill on, I mean, the rock on top of Mount Feek. And on top of this, there are places where obviously benches had been uh, mounted at some time in the past. And it would be nice if this was restored because it's a beautiful place to walk. Oops. Back up. Okay, end of that. Uh, so, so basically what's happening during this period of time is people are trying to figure out how do we have government? Do we have government that's a the theocratic government or do we have a government that's not a theocratic government? Do we have a government that's re ruled by the elite or do we have a government that's ruled by the population as much as possible? This is where the meeting house was. Um, here's the sign, uh, Faneuil Hall. This is this is downtown downtown Boston. And by 1635, they'd worked out a unique form of government that existed nowhere else in the world. There was a legal and judicial separation of church and state. Ministers and uh, uh, and the deputies of the church could not have a position in government and the persons in government could not have a position in the in the uh, in the church there was a definition of the rules of the governor the assistants and three elected representatives from each town the representatives had to concur and consent on all laws and taxes and they could enforce these decisions and also the representatives themselves coming from the people have the right to originate laws. Laws can come, come directly up from the population. And uh, in my career, I actually wrote a piece of legislation that became a law. Uh, and I just had to give my rep and he put it in, he submitted it and it became law. It was great. So Massachusetts is one of those places where individual citizens can write and submit law for consideration. The meeting, the government has to meet four times a year on a regular schedule, and the governor and the and the deputy governor have to be elected every year. And there are a series of inferior courts which can meet to locally decide and hear minor, minor issues and suits. So the point is that by this time we had a very working government which was unique to Massachusetts and actually unique to the world in which there was true representative government with representation, respect for the churches, but not ruled by the churches. And furthermore, the issue had been propounded by Dudley and others so hard that a formal decision was taken in 1635 to create a written comprehensive set of laws that would bind and limit the magistrates in a resemblance of the Magna Carta. It took a long time for this to happen, but when the first draft was written, it was sent to every town and had to be read out loud three times before it could be sent back with amendments as seen by the towns and then disputed again. So it took took almost, well, it took seven or eight years or 1639, depending on whether that's the first printing that you took, for 1648 to happen, in which 600 copies were printed so that each town and each court would have a copy of the laws and liberties and know where the law stood on things. Last stop in this tour will be uh, downtown. As you remember from the first slide that we saw, uh, there is a big gap as the water comes in and that's actually called the mill pond. I should have another picture of it here. 
But it was a remarkable thing that there was this big cove that could actually be blocked off with a causeway and it was deep. And it gave us a water mill, a salt water mill, no other place could have, because if you think of a bathtub, the best analogy is a bathtub, after it was sealed off, the water in a bathtub pours out of the spigot at high rate, fills up the bathtub, is turned off, and then when the bathtub is full and you've used it, you open the, open the spigot and water rushes out the bottom side at high rate too. And that's exactly how the mill pond worked. There were two sets of mills and as the water had been drained, and there was a dam, and as the water had drained out of it, running the lower mills, and the dam was closed at that end. So the mill pond was empty or effectively dry. Then the tide came up and a 10 foot tide would build up on the other side of the north end dam. And then that would be open and the water run rushing into the mill pond would run the mills on the north side and fill up the pond. And then the dam would be closed and the pond would be full and the tide would go out and so you had a head of 10 foot tide in the mill pond, which would rush out the lower end and run the mills on that side. So twice, twice every tide, the mills could run for three hours to, uh, to mill corn and everything else. It was a wonderful solution to how to we actually are gonna use, make a mill that can grind all of the stuff that we're gonna make. And meanwhile, the economics were working um, and the Blessing of the Bay was a ship that Governor Winthrop actually had had built uh, in 1631 and was used to spread the word basically and spread the colony around and to do the first of the economic things. So we really became a trading venture in 1631. Um, and in 1633 and 1640 and many ships were being built in Boston and in Salem um, and so it's easy to say by 1645, there were probably eight to 10 ships out of Boston regularly plying the uh, economic back and forth. And furthermore, our friend Oldham had been active in 1633. The records show that he brought back uh, three others returned from the Connecticut, which had actually helped bring people down into settled Connecticut, where the sachem of Connecticut had used them kindly and given them beaver. And he brought back some hemp, which is important for making rope, and also some black lead, which is important for making pencils. Brought that back in 1634. On the next trip, he brought back 500 bushels of corn. They would have given him a thousand, but their but the store fell out less than expected. And they also gave him a, an island in the Narragansett Bay, which island, after the Pequod War and after his death. Governor Winthrop acquired and shared it with Roger Williams and they and they raised hogs on this island. Pure, it's called uh, Prudence Island now. Um, and it still doesn't have any uh, electricity to it. You, there, it's, it's about, it's, it's long, it's a thousand acres, but all of the farms on there are still rural farms with no electricity. And finally, he was killed in his boat trading off Block, Block Island, and uh, Oldham was, with two, two English boys and two Native Americans, they were killed. And the, uh, the natives who killed him escaped to the flee to the Pequots Indians and the Pequots refused to return them to Boston for uh, punishment. And that a, act became the rationale for the Pequot War in 1638. 1636, 36, 38, which really was the first of the economic wars uh, of land conquest. And I remember reading Winthrop's diary and saying after 1638, when it's subdued, we have won this land by right of conquest, right of proper conquest. It was a proper war or whatever. So by 1635, this is the end of the tour. We've got now 129 families living in Boston from 26th in 1630. And the towns are springing up all over the place. As people can get to feeling we need a large piece of land and each town recognizes that there's gonna be people coming in and need a large piece of land because there are gonna be people inflowing and they will be able to give them to us. So by 1635, where we started in 1630 with Salem and Boston and Watertown, now there are 12 towns in town. And by 1645, we will add another 28. 
So how did they do this? They were deliberate. They were well organized. They were purposeful. They had a sense of, de sense of destiny that held them all together. They had come to populate the land, not for economic reasons, but for religious reasons, and they were doing that. They came prepared, they had good equipment, they were quick to understand what they were needed and they, they were able to, ex to implement any advantage that they could find. They had built a meeting house, they had distributed governments, they had a regulated economic life. They had basically, they had a full-fledged economy in five years and they had social structure was strong. School had been started, universal uh, literacy was the rule of the day uh, and Massachusetts Bay Colony was on its way to greatness. This is one of the tours that we do. The others that we do a founders trail tour. We just look at the beginning of the first year of the of where the founders came from. We do a tour on crime and punishment and what the judicial system was like. We do on Anne Hutchinson and the critical years when she challenged the established ecclesiastical structure and how they saw her, the belief, they saw her as a, in an infestation, really. We do a Pox's prescription tour and we talk about how medicine worked in the old days. And again, that leaks over into Hutchinson. They actually saw her as a form of infestation. And we do a third gen tour called the Third Generation, which talks about Boston in 1670s and 1680s and King Philip's War and how they changed everything. And, and if I get a chance to do a walking tour this year, I want to do a middle, do another tour, middle tour, middle years tour when things were really going well, but the charter was being challenged. So that's what we do. Um, and thank you on behalf of the partnership of the Historic Bostons for the opportunity to share this Boston history. I hope everyone's been able to hear me. And um, it's been it's been a fine adventure. Thank you very much.